When humans feel angry at the universe, their screeching, marauding fleets tremble, pick up weapons, and set their sights on earth. They didn't know what they knew. Their existence was discovered long before they arrived on the pale blue planet. The sleeping giant woke up and lay waiting. They were very, very angry. While Commander Zack was considering the tactical display, the creaking bridge of the flagship made a quiet sound. An image of Earth and its moon flashed before him, but this inferior species had primitive technology by galactic standards, and conquering Earth would not be easy. Croan intelligence had vastly underestimated humanity's resistance, and now hundreds of stealthy ships, warships, and orbital defense platforms surrounded Earth, and Luna Zai's mandibles clicked angrily. Even though the Croan fleet outnumbered the humans three to one and outnumbered them three to one, its soldiers were stronger, faster, and fiercer than the pink apes could hope to surpass in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Even though he was raised to conquer, orders were given. Using plasma, the gun is charged and ready for action. At 20,000 kilometers away, the Croat fleet slowed down and deployed into the Zeta attack formation. News Titans XYX thought about it but something seems wrong. Human warships remained in position, protecting Earth and the Moon. They showed no signs of aggression or fear. Were they paralyzed with fear of a giant groan? Perhaps they were hoping to beg for mercy? It was clear that communication between humans was uncomfortable. Surrender was not an option. It seems like he's planning something, but what kind of trap is it? New secret superweapon. Alert. Sirens blare. Commander detects multiple FTL signatures and yells to Sensor Officer XYX as he stares at the display in confusion and fear. Hundreds more human ships suddenly appeared on all sides, completely surrounding the roar. The ship was smooth and had many gun ports, but it wasn't there just a moment ago. A terrifying realization dawned on Zakes that humanity had mastered a technology faster than the teleportation of light and now the Croan fleet had no chance of escape and surrounded the hunter turn prey All ships were ready, the main guns were aimed at the flagship, and the bombardment was fired on my orders. The human admiral's orders through the XYX communications channel watched helplessly as thousands of rail guns and plasma cannons circled directly into the heart of the fleet. Maybe we shouldn't have angered the humans after all. Syrax thinks grimly as the human ships unleash hell on them, and it begins. A brutal introduction to the human concept of quid pro quo. The first volley of the human fleet tore through the unprepared, creaking ships like tissue paper, destroying dozens of cruisers and frigates. Soon the klaxon roared in a silent claw as an explosion tore apart the flagship, a direct hit from the cannons tore apart her hull, and her bridge rocked under the withering return fire. He roared and set his sights on their flagship and largest ship. First, Noise and plasma cannons and torpedoes hurtled toward the massive human fleet, only to be intercepted at gunpoint by defense installations, laser grids, and rail defense systems. A few stray bullets melted our armor, but none could penetrate the thick human cover. It became obvious right away. The cries were the absolute majority. Zix watched in shock as the heavy cruisers on the tactical display were torn apart one after another by the overwhelming firepower of the humans. How did the humans manage to build so many advanced warships under the noses of the croakers? Their final intelligence report reveals that humanity is fragmented and technologically superior. Regardless, powerful cloaks and even scientists were shown to have somehow utilized technology that was thought to be decades away. The silent crow trembled again as a barrage of missiles exploded into the spidery cracks in the shield above the bridge. Viewport they couldn't keep this pounding going much longer. All ships concentrated their fire on the human flagship, XYX, and her bridge crew as they burst into the frozen space. The magnetic projectiles continued to tear through the cruiser's interior, destroying compartments, fuel lines, and ammunition storage, while the silent claws set off a series of fiery explosions on the human flagship. The brave Admiral Harris watched grimly as the pods and coon pods drifted away from the dying Croan ship. He was less than five minutes into the battle, and the alien fleet was already starting to fall apart. This is almost too easy. He thought we should go after them and kill them. The admiral asked his ex-boyfriend dismissively. Harris replied, 
telling Croya to run home with his tail between his legs. Our message today was clear. The humanity of the world will not tolerate unprovoked attacks on our world. When the last smoking Croan Rex disappeared from his display, Harris opened a channel to earth, and the mission was accomplished. He reports that the invasion has been repulsed, and cheers erupt on every channel from the lunar base and defense platforms beneath earth. Humanity celebrated its victory and marveled at its technological breakthroughs. Crocars stabbed the dragon in its sleep and would not soon forget the results of its overwhelming victory over the Kokan invasion. A mood of victory and jubilation spread throughout the human-controlled universe. News of the battle spread like wildfire, with billions watching replays as Kokan's fleet tore apart humanity, facing its first true interstellar challenge and successfully overcoming it. But in the corridors of power, there was a dark reckoning with the new reality. Humanity was no longer isolated or technologically inferior. The development of the quantum wormhole drive catapulted humanity into the big leagues overnight, but it also drew a target on their heads. Humanity needed to expand its defenses, and the construction of additional orbital shipyards, defense platforms, and high-speed manufacturing centers soon began on Mars and the Moon. A new wave of powerful wormhole warships begins rolling off the assembly line, loaded with exotic metals and cutting-edge weaponry. Systems Admiral Harris was standing on the observation deck of her Dominion admiring the new Orion-class Dreadnought, one of the first ships of its kind with a total length of 15 kilometers. She had enough firepower to destroy a small moon. He will take command of the first long-range battle group, tasked with patrolling and securing human colonies up to 50 light-years from Earth. Admiral, we have received an update from Croya as his ex-commander Lewis reported. Aliens are increasing their military presence around the storm zone adjacent to our universe. Harris nodded grimly as several battle fleets headed to reinforce the outpost. A gigantic interstellar nebula storm known as the Storm Cloud marked the current boundary between humans, the cloaks, and the universe. For a long time, it was thought to be impossible, until the advent of quantum drives made skirmishes seem inevitable. You're testing our resolve, Harris, he replied, asking if we were overextending ourselves after recent technological leaps. Have they taken any active steps? Their ship is not yet on their side of the storm zone, so there is no border violation. We're not going to be the first to act or show weakness, said carrier group Harris Dispatch. The two destroyer squadrons head to the border patrol side, which is their priority mission. Our intelligence and reconnaissance units under no circumstances allowed to cross the storm area or take offensive actions. Is it obvious? Yes, Sir Lewis replied, and he departed to deliver his orders. Despite his soft-spoken voice, Harris felt that the future of humanity rested on his shoulders. Currently, four. Four hundred and forty-four billion lives depend on long-range and orbital defenses to ensure the safety of their colonies. It was a heavy responsibility, but one he gladly accepted. The groaners may be numerous and experienced, but humanity has innovation and righteous anger on its side. Harris silently vowed that one day he would come to stop the scions from crossing swords with humanity. Tensions continued over the next few weeks, but no clashes occurred as both sides continued to build up their forces. Border Harris was alarmed by the unusual suppression of his moans. Were they planning something? The answer was revealed at a high-level meeting at Fleet Command. He detected intensive shipping movement within one of the large Croatian colonies on the edge of the storm. Zorn reported it to intelligence officers. Long-range footage shows them assembling what appears to be an invasion fleet near the planet's moon. So far, there are more than 200 of her capital ships, with more arriving every day. An alarming murmur echoes through the conference room. A hologram of the moon comes to life, revealing a mile-long groan. Troop carriers and bristling battlecruisers converge eerily in orbit, containing the moon, and major fleet academies one of the gathering places roared, Admiral Nevada. They appear to be preparing for a major attack, but Admiral Locke says that amassing such a force would leave the central colonies weakened and defenseless. The confusion would be obvious on their faces, and they would be extremely vulnerable to counterattacks. Harris nodded slowly as he looked at the augmented reality display of the Crowan fleet. A plan materialized in his mind, 
not whether they were going to attack our core world quickly and powerfully before our eyes. I had time to respond to the conclusions that emerged from the assembled leaders and government officials. Croya poured everything into the depths of human space in one blow. How on earth are they going to get to our central colony? CHV said right away that even with quantum drives, no ship can cross the storm belt without tearing apart. Orion Sensor, First Battle Log, Answer, Harris Gravely, Our telemetry recorded the Croan ship with a focused graviton beam. I think they converted the quantum drive into some kind of wormhole stabilizer just before they left. The impact of this technology is devastating. Croaks can burrow into the heart of a storm, invade its territory unhindered, and appear right under humanity's noses. The Admiral's grim expression reflected Harris's own fear, but he also saw opportunity in his enemy's bold plans. By concentrating the main forces in one field, the core world was left unprotected. He announced, By mapping the Croan universe, we now have a chance to mount a decisive counterattack. Mr. Harris highlighted several inland colonies and industrial centers. While the door is open, I hereby propose that he form two rapid strike forces and quantum leap into these systems to attack their infrastructure and force production. The centers Harris created a magnified image of vast shipyards, their facilities crumbling, and we cut off the heads of the creaking war machines, leaving their invasion fleets to spread without reinforcements. A murmur of agreement echoed among the assembled crew. Orion's long-range combat group can lead Seoul. Respondents indicated that Nabi Harris nodded. We will also deploy new Ares cruisers. I would like to be able to leave within a week. He remained confident and kept the anger in his voice. It's time to take the fight closer to home for change. The officer saluted and resolutely went to work. Harris gave a wolfish grin. The Cyanians never imagined that humanity would create the heaviest hammer in the galaxy for the sleeping giants they had awakened. He then crushed the squawking settlers with his weight. Over the next seven days, there was much activity among the fleet leadership. The imminent threat of invasion mobilizes humanity into action. Countless preparations are made, contingencies are organized, logistics are organized, troops are assembled, battle cries are suppressed and Admiral Harris's iron gaze he strode around the complex, betraying no concerns whatsoever. He was seething inside him. The burden of leadership was heavy, but he did not give up. Harris headed to the intelligence reporting room. There, the latest reports on the movements of the Croatian fleet were compiled and analyzed. Several officers hunched over displays lining a circular room as data poured in from stealth probes tracking enemy fleets clustered near the storm. Zorn Harris stood behind the young officer, watching a screen showing thousands of ships emerging from the moon's gaping dock bay and crashing to land. What will be the final number of their invading force? Mr. Harris asked the lieutenant, who organized over 700 large warships. Well, our probits have identified several Imperium-class troop carriers, each capable of transporting five million ground troops. It also appears to be supplying fuel to the storage barriers of more than a dozen Shunt-class cruisers. These can accommodate 100,000 drones and armored vehicles. Each Harris's jaw clenched with great force. Could one of the human colonies and the wormhole stabilizer be easily overrun? Can you see their weapons? Yes, our scans show some of the largest warships with dedicated gravity and beam arrays near their FTL engines no doubt preparing to barrel straight through the storm belt. Masu. How long will it take to be fully assembled and ready for use? Given the current pace of construction, the left is postponing some reports. Our analysts expect Croaks to be ready to launch attacks within about two weeks. He is two weeks away from raining fire on humanity's frontier world, but Harris has a plan to dramatically change the tide. Please keep us informed of any plan changes. After knocking with a little surprise greeting each time a change came, Harris suddenly turned and left the room, his fresh uniform seeming to cut through the air. He didn't waste a second. His next stop was docking Bay 12, where the Orion was being prepared and resupplied for an upcoming deep attack. Harris' mission watched with satisfaction as swarms of technical bots raced atop the massive warship, repairing its hull, melting its armor, upgrading new weapon systems 
and replenishing its antimatter fuel. In careful preparation, the cruiser Ares and her task force underwent similar modernization work when Orion was first launched a year earlier. It was a miracle of ergonomics and ingenuity. The most powerful ship Earth has ever built. But now there were improved classes like the Ares coming out of the shipyards, making the Orion look almost obsolete in comparison. Humanity was progressing at breakneck speed, but he had no idea what awaited him in Bay 15. The chaos was brought under control as the second assault force readied itself. Harris believed the nests resembled an island preparing for war. Dozens of frigates and corvettes were lined up, and marines and mechs were practicing urban warfare. This strike force intends to attack an industrial center near the storm zone as a diversion. Tan Hot barked, attracting the attention of the strike leader as Harris relaxed and approached. Captain Harris replied, this is this is a production facility. G going in and out with minimal delay, the captain banged his fist on their chest. We hit hard and disappeared like ghosts. Groan wouldn't know what hit him. Harris nodded and headed to the control room. After checking with various captains and squadron leaders, they were confident that we were as prepared as possible. Now waiting for a few days has become the hardest part. He resisted micromanagement and forced patience although it was difficult. He continued to boost his morale and spirit as tensions rose. The day has finally arrived. The assembled fleet commanders stood around the auditorium, showing off their ships, regrouping at the edge of the storm belt like horses taking off, and preparing their crews. Harris then activated the room's viewscreen and squinted his eyes to display a tactical map of a nearby Crowan-controlled room on the other side. On the familiar ice sphere, the CIA discovers a fleet-gathering satellite that will soon launch an invasion of the enemy, and the war machine comes back to life, Harris announces, in their haste to leave their world unprotected. Did. Now let's punch her in the heart. The surrounding commanders listened intently. We will attack in two coordinated task force groups. Allen will attack Task Force Crowen here, an industrial and economic center. Hellstorm attacks military production near the moon and anchors invasion fleets in each target zone. If we succeed, the enemy's attack will collapse before it can gain momentum. Sierra faces turmoil at home and a possible rebellion in the colonies. He stood up and addressed the silent crew. You know the plan. You have a target. Give them hell, then retreat and wait for the CIA's response. In this campaign, he will be deployed one battle at a time. The steel commanders beat their chests in salute, and now prepare for my quantum jump signal, as Harris ordered today. We take the lead for the Earth. A cry of, For the Earth, rang out as Link stopped shoulder to shoulder with him. Harris opened a wormhole channel, and all the ship's jump spaces appeared to twist and warp around the two attacking forces. When a quantum wormhole opens, they appeared to stretch and break like rubber bands, then instantly disappear from the cock and watcher's sight. They just disappeared from existence. Shortly thereafter, cries of panic and alarm spread across several Croan colonies as the human shock troops returned to reality, light years behind enemy lines. Harris closely watched Pinnacle Hammer's launch from the control room, with video streaming back with surgical precision from the drone that accompanied the strike force. A creaking industrial center is suddenly attacked by human warships that appear out of nowhere, followed soon after by a barrage of railguns, projectiles, and plasma fire, reducing factories and shipyards to rubble. Fires raged through the Earth's atmosphere. The Hellstorm Task Force was tasked with attacking a munitions factory and base located on the CIA's frozen lunar dropship. She swooped in, deploying her marines and mechanized divisions across the airless surface but a commotion gathered to encounter unexpected danger, and fierce firefights broke out outside the bunkers and depots. However, humanity's goal was terrorism through asset destruction, not occupation. Harris watched calmly as his AR cruiser in orbit unleashed devastating firepower on the moon's vast military installations, laser ports, and railgun emplacements, turning much of its armor and aircraft into molten water. A dark sense of satisfaction crept into Harris's usually stone-faced demeanor. The enemy's preparations were kindled before him. Both attacking forces moved in and out within minutes, disappearing at their rendezvous point. 
The surgery was sudden, quick, planned, and devastating. Initial reports have been confirmed. The attack damaged the CIA's production capacity by more than 60%. Their invasion schedule will be delayed by at least several months. Most importantly, humanity has sent us a clear message. We will fight back with overwhelming force. The sleeping giant woke up in the auditorium. When news of the second attack arrived, the commanders cheered. There were handshakes and congratulations. Everywhere, they inflicted devastating blows without causing any casualties. Champagne was provided for Harris and his staff, but the admiral's expression remained stiff. This was just the opening salvo in what was likely to be a long conflict. If humanity wants to secure its place, it will need to remain adaptable, smart, and ruthless. Under the stars, Crone's fleet struggles to regroup after humanity's devastating opening attack. Their ship lay in ruins, releasing its atmosphere and bodies into the cold, ancient space of space. Commander Zakes gripped the command console in frustration as warning sirens blared over the ruined bridge of the silent Talon's damage report. He screamed, his lower jaw clicking in pain. Bridge officers were working with air traffic control to assess the situation. The first officer reported that the main power had failed, there were multiple hull breaks on all decks, and 12 to 20 casualties were piling up in the AR section. Our shields are depleted and our weapon systems are completely down. Six hit him on the armrest with a clawed fist. This battle was supposed to be their glorious victory over the humans, but now his fleet was shattered to pieces in minutes, and Kens would not easily admit defeat. Lockdown affected decks and restore emergency power. Now Six roared. Bring us here and prepare to counterattack the human flagship. The brave Admiral Harris studied his tactical presentation. As the cloak struggled to reorganize its tightly coordinated attack formation, the arriving aliens fell into a disorganized heap as the ship opened up the atmosphere and became uncontrollable. But his experienced eyes noticed a larger warship turning gravely to face the human fleet again, its plasma weapons banking with increasing anger, sir. The enemy's flagship and several heavy cruisers appeared to be attempting a counterattack, a weapons officer shouted. Leave me alone. Harris replied calmly. Our attack was only the first volley. Please continue. All the batteries fire at will, reducing the precious fleet to a floating wreckage. The brave trembled slightly as a giant plasma cannon fired, sending bolts of superheated material into the creaking ships surrounding the human fleet. Thousands more rail guns, grenades, and particle beams erupted and joined the fight in the stillness of space. The huge energy release was strangely beautiful, like a ghostly neon tendril connecting the two fleets. Then they made contact, and the creaking ship exploded horribly. No eye or camera could fully capture the combined firepower of the human fleet, which exceeded anything the aliens' arrogance had imagined. Harris watched the tactical display update in real time without breaking his concentration. The symbol of the Croan fleet flashed, turning red, and the ship was blown away. Alien counterattacks were sporadic and ineffective, easily absorbed by the human fleet's powerful shields. It was a completely one-sided massacre that lasted from minutes to hours. Occasionally, a damaged crone, cruiser, or frigate attempts to retreat, only to be intercepted by human barrage ships. The entire area was blocked off by a quantum interference field, making it impossible to escape. Until the artificial night cycle begins— Jiva will no longer exist. The final cry wavered and became dark, announcing the complete annihilation of the attacking armada. Nearly a thousand alien ships were destroyed, and their crews were thrown into the freezing vacuum of space. Harris rubbed his eyes, the weight of all the lives lost weighing heavily on his shoulders. Although it was necessary, the admiral reported his departure with a somber expression. We find several escape pods, and after some thought, we order Harris to activate a recovery drone, board the pods, and take the prisoners for interrogation. He concluded that no further aggressive measures were permitted. Beyond this point, the bridge crew breathed a collective sigh of relief. The battle is over, and Earth is safe. They won the day with overwhelming power and advanced technology. But for Harris, that victory was hollow, and many dead and groaning men would surely return for revenge. 
after today's disastrous defeat. This was not yet over, as the human fleet moved in to secure the wreckage zone. Harris has opened a channel for fleet calm on Earth. He stood straight in his uniform, his voice quiet, and then said, Mission accomplished. The invasion was repulsed, but this was only the first skirmish. Croya will return with a larger force, so we must pool our resources to immediately increase defense production. Communication failures continue to unravel as humanity celebrates its first victory and prepares for a prolonged interstellar war.